Thank you. There's a, a Chinese proverb which you hear quite a bit in Silicon Valley, and it's a somewhat literal translation, meaning, may you live in interesting times. And some people go so far and say it's a curse. The one thing I can guarantee you, though, is, and this is what we're seeing in Silicon Valley day by day, is that we do live in very interesting times. And the easiest way to explain this is, we're talking about something at, at Singularity University a lot, which we call exponential technology. So if you go back in your math class and you remember how an exponential trend looks like, it is something like this. So basically, an exponential, the core of an exponential is it doubles every time period. Um, the curves always have this kind of weird sh um, uh, look of like it goes kind of slowly and then they go pretty crazy. And we're seeing this in technology happening again and again and again. So let me give you the most famous exponential trend, uh, which is Moore's law. So Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel, uh, pretty much to the day 50 years ago said that the number of transistors per square inch on an integrated circuit doubles every two years. What this means in layman's terms is that your cell phone, your computer, anything which has a chip built in gets pow more powerful by literally the year. And to illustrate this point, let's look at this thing here. This is a Cray-1 supercomputer. It uh, was released in 1975. In today's dollars, this thing would cost you about 36 million US dollars. This computer already had more compute power in a single device than what you had back in the day to put the man on the moon in terms of total compute power. So everything NASA had basically in terms of compute power in a single device, $36 million. This thing has 80 megaflops. This means you can do 80 million floating point operations per second. If you pull out your aging iPhone 5S, this is 150 thousandths of the cost of a Cray. It has a thousand times the compute power. So the computer in your pocket today is effectively a supercomputer, not just one supercomputer, but a thousand times over. It gets a little crazier. This came out a couple of months ago. This thing is called the Pi Zero. It's the size of a pack of gum. It cost you $5, literally the price of a Starbucks venti latte. And when you look at the, the raw compute power of this thing, this is two and a half supercomputers for five bucks. Or you take it to the extreme, um, this, is a, this is basically the brains and the heart of the self-driving car. This comes from a company called NVIDIA. This computer, this machine, costs you less than $1,000. It has 24 teraflops. This computer is 10 billion times better in terms of price performance than what you had with this crazy one supercomputer. This is what exponential technology looks like. Now, it's not just computers. It's happening in many, many other industries. And this is what we study at Singularity University. We're talking about uh, what's happening in artificial intelligence, in robotics, in nanotechnology, energy systems, synthetic biology. Let me give you one more example. This is the cost of DNA sequencing. The first time we sequenced the full human genome was in 1999. The effort took us seven years cost us 2.7 billion US dollars. This is an incredible feat for mankind, taking the full human genome and sequencing the whole thing. 1999, 2.7 billion dollars. In 2007, we did this the first time commercially. So there was a company which commercially sequenced the human genome. This took a couple of months and cost you $350,000. Two years ago, a company in San Francisco called Illumina came out with a machine which looks like a big photocopier, sequences the human genome for $1,000. Within 15 years, the price dropped from something only governments can do to something your doctor can prescribe. The this is the price performance ratio. When you look at the upper part of that curve, the upper part of the curve is a perfect exponential curve according to Moore's law, so doubling every uh, every time period. Then something really interesting happened in terms of technology and it rapidly dropped. Now you can ask the experts, where does this actually go to? So we're currently at $1,000. The experts will tell you that in a couple of years that price will drop to pennies. So in the next five to ten years, sequencing the human genome will become free. What does this mean? Well, very simple. Conceivably, when you go to the toilet in the future, your toilet will sequence your, your genome and gives you a full health report every single time you use the toilet. This is not hypothetical. This company here is a company called Toto. They're a very large uh, toilet manufacturer in Japan. 
They will tell you that they are not in the business of making ceramics anymore. They're in the business of providing health advice. Or, and here's the dark side of technology, every single person here sheds DNA at the moment. You're shedding cells. You're losing hair, you're losing follicles, you're losing skin cells. The moment you leave this room, Lars and I will hoover up <laughs> and we run a full genomic fingerprint on every single person in this room. I have a full genomic fingerprint of every single person who is in this room. True story, the President of the United States, when he travels and he goes to what is called a rogue state, Russia, for example, the Secret Service hoovers up behind him and they wipe down the glasses because they do not want to leave genomic fingerprints. True story. Ray Kurzweil formulated this in something called the Law of Accelerating Returns. This is basically the generalization of uh, Moore's Law. And this is a really important piece here, which is every time you take something which is an analog technology today and you turn it into something digital, it automatically becomes exponential. So if you're an entrepreneur here, the one best advice I can give you, find an industry which is not digital today and turn it into a digital industry, and I can guarantee you the riches. But, and this is the important piece, technology for the sake of technology is interesting and probably intellectually stimulating, but it's not that meaningful. And we are not here to just, you know, get excited about technology. What we're really interested in is, is the big picture. And to kick us off here, I want to start with a quote from Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein said that we shall require a substantially new manner of thinking if mankind is to survive. The emphasis is on survive and new manner of thinking. And I postulate that technology could be that new manner of thinking. When you look at something like our big blue planet, the United Nations expects that the population will rise to about 9 billion people by the year 2050, so in about 35 years. Today, food is a distribution problem. There's enough food on this planet to feed 7.2 billion people. It's just in the wrong places. And don't get me wrong, it's a really hard problem to solve. There is not enough food today on this planet to feed 9 billion people. We need to grow agricultural output by 2% annually. We're currently growing at 1%. So if we are not deploying technology to get this up, we have a real problem. Or you take something which is very well known to you in Europe, particularly in, uh, if you're in Southern Europe, you take employment. The World Bank came out with a report saying that we need to um, create 600 million new jobs in the next 14 years to sustain globally our current employment rate. I can guarantee you that this will not happen. We need to redesign society to be okay with people working 20 hours or being okay with an un unemployment rate of 20, 30 percent. Or you take something like global warming. Most experts will tell you that the uh, sea levels will rise by two meters by uh, the end of this century. Now, most people make a, a big mistake when they think about global warming. They think about global warming as a, this is going to be a shift in weather patterns. We see more typhoons and, you know, like these kind of things. The reality of this is two meter sea level rise means that vast amounts of land will be underwater. So you take something like Manhattan Island. Manhattan Island is flooded when we have two meter sea level rise. This is eight million people who need to find a new home. You take Bangladesh, a whole country, which is about 250 to 400 million people which will need to move. If you want to get a sense of what this means, just look at the Syrian refugee crisis, take that and multiply it by 100. This is the future we are moving into. Or you take something like poverty, it boggles my mind that to this day, there's three billion people living on less than two and a half dollars a day. I cannot drink a Starbucks coffee for less than two and a half dollars. Or you take sanitation, two and a half billion people don't have access to proper sanitation, making diarrhea the number one killer in the world. Water, 800 million people don't have access to clean drinking water, something we take for granted. Or lastly, you take malnutrition, there's a child dying every six seconds of malnutrition. Now, I am the most optimistic person, and some people say they kicked me out of Germany because I'm too optimistic. <laughs> I believe, I fundamentally believe that as dire as these problems are, we can solve them. And technology is a vector. It's not the solution, but it's a vector to solve them. And I want to show you an example. This is a really good friend of mine called Nithya. Nithya started a company called Nextleaf with four other people, so five people in total. What they're tackling is, a problem which is very prevalent in the developing world, which is uh, vaccines spoiling because there's a break in the cold chain. So if you have a vaccine, it needs to be 
kept at a specific temperature in a fridge, and when you have a, a break in the cold frame, that vaccine doesn't work anymore. In the best cases, you have high-end vaccines. They've got a little like sign on the vial, and you know it's not working. In the worst cases, you actually kill someone. In the medium case, you administer a vaccine which is ineffective. This is a problem which affects 33% of all vaccines administered in the third world. A third of vaccines are ineffective because of a break in the cold chain. So Nithya and her team tackled this problem. They developed this little black box. Let me open the black box for you. The little black box consists of something extremely simple. This is an Android smartphone which they source in China, costs $25. There's a little, like, you see the little hardware part in there that costs about 25 cents to produce. It has a temperature sensor. You put it into a plastic box. The whole thing costs about $40. To give you an idea, even a cheap temperature, a uh, cheap vaccine fridge in the third world costs about $2,000. So this is about 5% of the cost. You bolt it against the fridge. Now it travels with the fridge. It measures temperatures continually, and it does something really interesting because this is a connected device. So it sends a text message, an SMS message, to the nurse to let the nurse know if there was a break in the cold chain alongside the whole uh, cold chain. It also, and this is interesting, it sends the data up into the cloud because typically what you see with cold chains is that the breaks happen at very specific points in it. So it's always like this one port where they forget to um, plug it in. It's always this one person who forgets to open the door or close the door. Or it's this one person who turns up the fridge too high and basically freezes the vaccine. Now, Nithya came to me with this idea. She had this thing built, and I asked Nithya one very simple question. I said, what does it take to make the problem go away? Because you have the solution in your hands. So Nithya went to the Gates Foundation, got $2 million from Gates Foundation. She went to Google.org, got another $2 million from Google.org, and started to work with the World Health Organization to roll this thing out. This thing today is in six countries. It's in three large units in... Um, India, and it's literally saving millions of lives, and they're just getting started. There's still only 20 people. Now, here's the reason why I'm telling you this. Not because this is a great story in and of itself. The reason why I'm telling you this is because you can do this. Every single person here can either do this themselves, or if you're not the coder, the hardware guy, the whatever, you know someone who can do this. This is not rocket science. This is banking on an exponential trend, which is I have a supercomputer for 25 bucks, which I can buy in China, which is connected to the cloud, which gives me all the data I need in the world, and puts all this into like one single package. But you can do this. And this is the reason why I'm so incredibly optimistic about the future, because I see more and more and more people, young people, startups, tackling these big, big, big problems. I want to leave you with a quote, and this is the, first, the most uh, Favorite quote of my, my life, uh, this is George Bernard Shaw, who said, the reasonable man adopts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in adopting the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man and woman. So you have to be unreasonable. Thank you.